Hi, everybody. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Me and Anna will be leading this session, and we will be presenting you a real-world example of how to perform sales forecast in retail whenever the business comes to you and asks you to predict the unpredictable in an ever-evolving landscape. So just starting by framing where are we working, Sonai is a multinational corporation that is managing multiple businesses from telecommunications to fashion, real estate. And today we will be focusing on food retail and health and wellness at MC. You might have had the chance to visit one of our continent supermarkets, which is the core business of MC, and that is present all over the country and it's being opened in the past 38 years. So you may imagine what a hype it was back then uh, to have a big supermarket being opened in Portugal. Continent is also the market leader in food retail with 28% market share. And we believe that one of the keys for such success is our loyalty program, where we get the most of our insights on customer behavior. Our loyalty program accounts for 80% of the households in Portugal and covers most of our customer behavior, accounting for 80% of loyalty penetration in sales. So just to have you an idea, we're talking about 13 tickets per second being registered. And we're talking about a lot of information. We're talking about a company that is able to have customers uh, using their card in our stores, and we must depend on the expertise of multiple teams connecting and talking every day in order to make this a success. And if you had to pick a KPI that is able to join the managers and the marketing teams together every week, which one would you say that it is? Correct? You are thinking about sales, I heard it back there. And you are 100% correct. But not only looking to past sales, but mainly looking to future sales in order to be able to redesign the marketing strategies. We've been performing and sharing sales forecasting for a while at MC. And as data, as data literacy is increasing in our enterprise, so does the complexity of the challenges. Our sales forecasting should enable the marketing teams in taking actions. So explainability is a core challenge that we must address. Having features that impact your sales and that are actionable, like mass marketing campaigns, but also target communications, split by features that are also impacting your sales, but are not, are not actionable, such as weather forecast, is a powerful insight. And having Long-term forecasts is a must for the establishment of long-term um, mac of macro strategies. But a question arised, how to cope with uncertainty in a world where the only constant became the constant contextual changes? This arised with COVID, but we've seen until today that this is a topic that remains relevant and that we must still today address. So today, we will be presenting you a framework that deals with these two topics. Also making sure that we evaluate results with autonomy and with transparency and having the right amount and the right balance of flexibility to retrain the model whenever it is needed. So I just gave you a, con a context in terms of the business challenges. Anna, would you like to show us the framework and our proposal so as a solution design? Yes, of course. So, uh, in response to these challenges, we have implemented within our company a framework that not only allows us to capture sales patterns, of course, but also to accumulate unforeseen e effects that we are not able to anticipate at all. COVID-19 is actually a really good example of it because it had a profound impact on our customers' behavior and as well in our sales, of course, for a long period of time. I will go into it in a few more minutes, but for now, let's focus on this framework and understanding its main steps. So first things first, we start by laying the foundations, by building a baseline forecast. This is what we are all used to thinking when we speak about sales forecasting. And it served us well in the initial iterations of forecasting in our company, 
But as we recognize the need to be more responsive to customer changes, our approach, approach also evolved. And we added another step, that is, how can we accommodate unforeseen events and changes in customer behavior? To do so, first we need to identify if there has been a change in customer behavior and if that change is systematic. I will explain this more closely, what do I mean by systematic, but I think it's pretty easy for you to understand that it could be the case that we have a change in our customer behavior, but it could be really specific or of an event or of a period of time and really restricted in the time frame. So perhaps not worth considering for future projections. We'll also see how can we distinguish those from the ones that are systematic and that we should reflect and capture in future predictions and how can we quantify them effectively. Last but not least, I will also show you how we make all of this happen in our company, where we put the proceeding interacting between them. So let's start, now that you understood the main step, let's go deeper into each one of them. The first one that I said was the one that lays the foundations. It's really a straightforward approach. And because of that, I will only touch on key topics briefly. But if you'd like to know it more in detail, of course, that we can always discuss it afterwards. One thing that I think is really important for you to be aware is that one of our marketing team's requirement is that at the beginning of each year, we need to have a forecast of our weekly sales until the end of that year. So it's based on that that they establish their macro strategies so that they can reach the goals. How do we do that? So we start, like always, by collecting data. We use our internal data and we also blend it with external data. In what comes to our internal data, we rely on the obvious ones, which is historical sales data, of course, but we also tap into more information, such as promotional activity. In Portugal, we ride the high-low pricing waves, so promotions have a huge impact in our stores, and we need to consider them. As an example of external variables that we use, I can speak on forecast for ex weather forecast, for example. We know that when it's heavily raining, like, like the past week, people are less likely to hit the beach and much more likely to go to our, to our shops, and so we need to consider also that. After we have all this data collected, not only this one that I spoke about, but many more, we are now ready to modeling it. We are using, at this moment, neural profit. Okay, we, in the past, we have used other models. This was not our first iteration in doing forecasting, as Anna said. We have already used linear regression and ARIMA, but we are always testing for new uh, hypotheses. This one was the one that performed the best results until now. It combines neural networks with time series algorithms. We have chosen because it was the one that provides us the best results. We are always looking for that. But it also enables us to understand the contribution of the time series components, such as trends, seasonality, and also the contribution of the other features that we are considering it. This is really important for us because it, put, it puts a check on the explainability that Anna spoke about. Then we also need to track the results and always be assessing our models. To do so, we use MAP, mean average percentile error, which is a widely used metric in sales forecast, and it has a huge advantage that is, is really easy to explain to the business. We also have put it here an example of a, of a forecast when we developed this model, and here you can see the actual values and the forecast ones. And you can see that the two lines are really closely aligned. So by doing this, we are able to capture sales pattern. Now we have our baseline. Let's talk, of, let's talk about the interesting part, that is how can we accommodate unforeseen um, events and detect changes in customer uh, behavior. To do so, I will talk you about a, a real example because I think it makes it more easy for you to understand and for me to explain it. So, when uh, we have here an example that is of the year 2020, uh, really a typical year, as we all know. And here you have the forecast sales using the baseline model that I spoke about. And you have also the actual sales. So, you can see that we have two standout points that I circled in red and that I would like to highlight. 
The first one happened on the weekend when the Portuguese government announced that we will all going into lockdown. So everyone heard about the rush to go to the supermarkets to buy food, toilet paper, and so on. And so here you can see the impact that it had on our sales. We have here a huge peak. At the end of the year, we also have another standout point that was Christmas anticipation. This was a direct result of our marketing campaigns in order to anticipate Christmas shopping and avoid overcrowding in the stores. I think it's pretty easy to understand that these kinds of events, we are not expecting them to be repeated in the future, and so perhaps not worth considering in future projections. And that is why we thought it would be important to distinguish those that are one-off changes from the ones that are systematic. After that first peak, you can see in the shaded area, in the blue area, that our actual sales, the line in blue, are constantly above our forecast ones. So our customers had a change in their behavior because they were locked down into their houses without the possibility of going to restaurants, working at home, eating more, and so buying more groceries at our stores. And we noticed that we have here always a systematic uh, change in the behavior. So we thought, OK, if we didn't have make any change to our initial forecast, our forecast will be completely outdated and no one will use that. So we decided that we need to capture and reflect these systematic changes in our customer behavior in order to have accurate forecasts. To do so, we understood that, OK, we, learn, we need to learn from the past errors. So we are used to have a prediction that has errors close to zero and randomly distributed. This is what we are all expecting. But when we see that we have a pattern in the errors, we saw it as an, OK, that's an opportunity for us to capture the changes in the customer behavior. How have we done that? So now, at this current moment with this framework, our final forecast is a baseline, it's based on, the, it's a composite forecast, of course, that takes into account the baseline forecast that we predict at the beginning of the year and that we need to do so. And also a forecast tuning that runs every two weeks and that taking into account the past errors, it makes adjustments for the predictions of the next weeks. So let me explain you. So we have always our baseline model and as, sorry, I put it, okay, so we have here our baseline model and as the time goes by, we have a model that by looking at the best errors makes adjustments to future projections. Let me show you how this worked for us. So here in this image, you can see that our final forecast, that is the composite one, was really closely aligned with the baseline forecast because we do not have evidence that we should do this adjustment. But once we run this model, we understood that our final forecast should be higher, and now it's much more closely to the actual one than with the initial one. So by doing this, we are able to capture a change in the customer behavior and also adapt our forecasts. To do so, we are using LSTM, long short term memory, which allow, which we are using it because it was the one that provided us the best results, of course, again. And we are using it because it deals with special data and it also has some gating mechanisms that allow us to give different weights to different information from the past. Now you may be wondering if this is too volatile. We are changing our predictions twice a week just to, for the following weeks. And I also spoke about the one-off changes that we do not want to capture and reflect them in the future. And we have come up with a mechanism that, that allows us to be much more conservative when making these adjustments. So we are, we are in a real case scenario with real implications, so we tend to be more conservative when making these adjustments. And we only want to do them when we have the evidence that we should do so. To do this, we have always a challenger model that is a model that is trained with the most recent data and we compare always this model with the champion that we have currently at that moment. The one that outperforms, the, the, if the challenger outperforms the champion, then it begins, it begins to, 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 see, to, to see the new champion. And then we also put this champion into another stress test that is comparing it with the baseline forecast for the most recent data. Just, and it could be the case that no adjustment is even made. If we do not evidence that we should do that, we do not do it. 
this second part of our framework is particularly useful in contextual changes. And we are always speaking about COVID, COVID, and you may be thinking that COVID is a thing from the past. But this approach also has proved its value during other changes in our context. For example, in the economical context, when inflation arose, we also were able to capture it and adjust our predictions by, taking, by using this framework. We are also expecting that when deflation happens, if it happens, we, we do not know where it's going to be, that this also will be able to capture it and adjust our predictions. I'm saying that this is particularly useful in contextual changes. Let me just, uh, let me just show you that that is true with real data. So we have here this framework applied to a much more stable period before COVID, before inflation and all of that. And we can see that it only led us to a reduction of a um, map of one, around 1%. Which is really small, but is, it is what we are expecting because we don't have, do not have a pattern in our errors. They are closely to zero and randomly distributed. So in most of the cases, no adjustment was even made in our initial forecast. And because of that, we do not see a huge contribution. That is what we also expect when not, nothing changes. But in a more uncertain environment like the one that I show you on, that, on, the, on this year, it led us to a reduction on the map of around 25%, which is really good in our opinion. Now, before just showing you how to make all of this happen, let me just cover a point that I think I haven't covered yet and that you may be wondering about, is that why aren't we just simply adding more data into our input data set and generating a new baseline and just cutting the second part? We are not doing this because we do not know until when that change in customer behavior will happen and what change will it be. So by generating new forecasts, we could be just simply reflecting this into all the data set. And we will also be always generating new predictions. We will also lose track about what's going to happen. Are we having different forecasts because the data set input, because there was a change in customer behavior or because we simply moved out the change of the data that are in our input data set. By having this, we can see that we are making corrections and go after it. Okay, so what change in our customer behavior to to have to have to make us to, to need these uh, changes? Finally, I will show you just how we make all of this happen. So this is running completely automatically, both the baseline forecast as well as the forecast tuning and, and it's shared directly to our marketing teams. Okay, Our technological stack is running on Azure and we are always monitoring it live just to be sure that everything is working as supposed. Just... To finish my presentation, I would like to wrap up by saying to you that this we come up with this framework because this we come up by this by doing it an iterative approach. So we are doing this because we had a real problem, and marketing teams came up to us and said, okay, "You need to fix this. We are the, we are COVID is now the new normal, so we need we need help in doing this." And so we come up with this, and it also has proved its value in other changes. And being constantly changing is now the new normal. So I hope you have enjoyed and that this serves you as an inspiration. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a bunch of questions. So, <laughs> perfect. First obvious one, I think, re re replay from what happened also with the previous one. How do you account for the weather? Because, yeah, obviously it's important for the sales, but I mean, so, weather forecasts, right? Okay. <laughs> okay. So, we would like to have always the weather forecast, but as we do the, the the, this forecast at the beginning of the year, we only have the historical data of the past year. So we use historical data as a reflection of what's going to happen. We made that analysis by looking at several years and it didn't change the results dramatically. And so we are using now the, the weather of the weather information that we have from the previous year. And we also use some interactions 
like if if it's raining on the weekend, it could be different than raining on weekdays and stuff like that. Yeah. Okay. You can add something because mm -hmm. in the initial approach, approach, and I just said that before we used linear regression, and back then when it is just an equation, you can just update for the weather forecast for the following weeks mm -hmm. in the same way as we are using the LSTM. So Clear. Thank be. you. Uh, Competi okay, competitor activity, that's a good one. How do you incorporate that? Because especially in a business like retail, I mean, that's a killer. That's a killer feature potentially, if you can do something about that. Uh, in terms of features? Yes, we how, are... how do you account for it? Yeah, well, we have Starting spies. Starting the data. <laughs> we have spies all Hush. over, everywhere. <laughs> You're not supposed to say that part out loud. <laughs> yeah, because actually opening new stores is a process that takes a long time. Okay. So you can see the buildings that the companies are buying and you can actually embed it in your models with a lot of advance. When you are talking about digital competitors, it's a little bit different, but Portugal, I think we're not there yet. Okay. And uh, something that also caught my attention, you mentioned, you mentioned that you were using the mean average, the MAPE uh, as a metric. It's fine if you don't have zero sales periods, but if something is very low or unstable for a long time, then at least in my experience, MAPE tends to blow up and behave very nastily. So I was wondering if you had any comments on that. So we are predicting the global sales. So we are, we don't have that. We have all, Aha. so we don't have, we Because don't the aggregation have that, so. level is high enough. Yes. yes okay. Yes. It's so we don't day. have that. Yes. Fair enough. And it has the advantage that is really simple to explain. So everyone talks about map really easily mm, in our Without competition. question. Yes. <laughs> Clear. Okay, next one. Uh, how do you account for store assortment and cannibalization effects? Do you, do you incorporate that? Actually, we don't have such a problem with this because we are doing it daily. If we were doing it by store, then it would be a huge problem. Mm -hmm. And since we're doing it aggregated, things just um, balance each other. Okay. Even if we open a new store and if it's cannibalizing sales from the other stores, it's already included in the trend and in terms of global sales. So it hasn't been an issue. Okay. Yes. And we have time for one last one. Uh, how do you incorporate the impact of promotions? Or all, yet another, you don't care because it's aggregated. <laughs> Um, we tried many things. Actually, in terms of macro strategies, it's quite constant and, uh, during the entire year. It may change between customers. So we had a trial before having redemption rates by customer. But mm -hmm. when you are doing it aggregated again, it doesn't impact that much. So we tried it, but then it's just not um, explicable. 